First of all, about ourselves. Let me show you another verse which I often call one of the scariest verses in the New Testament. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 11, we are told that God himself will deceive certain people. Is it possible that God himself will allow you to be deceived? Listen to this. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false. Now, we've always had the impression that God is always out to get people to believe what is true. But here's what God's word says, that he will purposely make people believe what is false. That God is out to get some people to believe what is a lie. Really? Why does God do that? Why in the world would God allow somebody to believe something that's false? That means, for example, to believe he's born again when he's not born again. To believe he's filled with the Holy Spirit just because he spoke in tongues. To believe that. And to live all his life in that delusion. God will allow him to believe it. To believe that a person has got some supernatural gift which he doesn't have, he's got a counterfeit. God will allow people to believe that they are holy when they're not. That scares me. I tell you it scares me. And to me that's one of the scariest verses in the Bible. I say, Lord, is it possible I'm fooling myself that I'm born again? That I'm fooling myself that I'm filled with the Holy Spirit? That I'm fooling myself that I'm holy when I'm not? That I'm fooling myself that I'm building the church Jesus is building when I'm maybe building my own empire? Lord, open my eyes. Who are the people, Lord, you deceive like that? That's the category I don't want to be in. Now listen to this. God will send upon them. Who are the them? That's what I want to know. I don't want to be in that group. It speaks about the activity of Satan in verse 9. In the last days, Satan is going to come with powers and signs and false wonders. Please remember that. We're living in that time. False miracles. With all the deception of wickedness. For those who perish. Why? This is a very important statement here. Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Just listen to that expression. The love of the truth so as to be saved. If I don't receive the love of the truth to be saved, the Bible says God will send upon me a strong delusion so that I will believe what is false. There's no partiality with God. It doesn't say, well, if you're a believer, you'll sort of escape that. It's like the law of gravity. If you jump off the roof of a building, the law of gravity is not going to first check up whether you're a believer or not. It doesn't matter. It's like that, God's laws. He will deceive those who don't love the truth. But you say, I'm a believer. But you don't love the truth when God's trying to show you something about yourself? Maybe in a, in a service like this, God speaks something to your heart and you, you're not willing to face up to it? Because you think you're so spiritual and you're giving everybody else the impression that you're so spiritual, you're not willing to face up to the fact that you're a hypocrite of the first order. You don't love the truth. I tell you, brother, you're a candidate for deception. Not by the devil, but by God himself. The Bible says the devil's a deceiver. He's against me. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, my lusts are deceitful. The devil's out to deceive me. The world is full of people who are out to deceive me. My only hope is if Almighty God, my Father, will protect me from deception. But if God himself turns around, also joins all these other people to deceive me, I'm doomed. I'm finished. There's no hope for me. And I can be as deceived and think I'm right, like the way thousands of years... Man thought, 
that the sun goes around the earth. And man was absolutely convinced. They could say, I believe what I see. The sun goes around the earth and they were wrong. That is how easily we can be fooled. What's the solution? How shall we escape that deception? It's very simple. Love the truth and seek to be saved. Love the truth first of all about yourself. When the Holy Spirit shows you something, be honest and face up to it. I told you how I kept on repenting of praying to seek the honor of men. I'd go before God and say, Lord, that's the truth. I sought honor there. I'm sorry. And it happened again and again and again for years. But I said, Lord, I'm determined to be free from it. And when God sees that you're really determined to be free, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The Lord says, you shall seek me and find me, not when you seek me whole half-heartedly, but when you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Jeremiah 29, 13. And it's like that. If you're willing to say, Lord, I want to know all the truth about myself. How many of you would seriously say that? Lord, I want to know all the truth about myself. I've said that many times to God. I said, Lord, I don't want any surprises at the judgment seat of Christ. I want zero surprises. I don't want you to tell me at the judgment seat of Christ that there's something in me which I did not know when I was on the earth. Why didn't you tell me when I was on the earth? Because I was unwilling to listen? Because I did not love the truth about myself? May it never be. I am determined that when I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, there will be nothing that God has to show me which I did not discover when I was on the earth. Of selfishness, pride, love of money, subtle things where, which I can imagine I'm free from just because I happen to be better than others. You see, if everybody in a class is getting 2% and 3% and 4% in mathematics, and I get 10%, I'm pretty good. That's how a lot of Christians are. They think they're spiritual because they're better than most other people in their church. So what? Jesus said, I am the truth. How do we compare when we line up with him? Is it possible that there could be so many things in our life where, about which it has to say, God is not well pleased. And we congratulate ourselves because God's using us and giving us a word and we know this and we're getting revelation on this verse and that verse. But we are not free from lying. The sin of Ananias and Sapphira. I've often felt that if Ananias and Sapphira, if Ananias was in the church in Corinth, he'd have been an elder, right? Because he's pretty good compared to the others in Corinth. The problem was he was in the wrong church. He was in that fiery church in Jerusalem. And you know that. You can go to some third-rate church and you can be an elder there. But you come to a church where the fire of God is burning like anything, you'd, you'd be considered the most carnal, backslidden believer. It depends on which company you are in. Dear brothers and sisters, let's learn to love the truth with all of our hearts. God's word is the truth, and Christ is the truth. So I think of these two. When I look at my life in comparison to Jesus Christ, and I seek to do that every day of my life, to compare my life with Christ's, and I see areas in my life where I'm not 100% true. In the same way, God's word is the truth. When I read something in God's word, which is not what I have always believed. You know, all of us have got a doctrinal mold in which we have grown up. The particular 
church we grew up in or the particular teacher whom we admired listening to, a doctrinal mold. And one day I read the scripture and I find some of those things I believed are not exactly like it says in scripture. Am I willing to change my mind and view and say I was wrong all these years? I was wrong for 35 years, but now I see this is what God's word says. That is loving the truth. But I find very few people who have the moral courage to take that stand and say, I was wrong there. I've now discovered through careful study of the word that that is not what God's word teaches, even though 99% of people in my church believe it and practice it. That's not what God's word teaches, and I'm willing to stand different. I remember when God began to open my eyes to the new covenant and many of the glorious truths that changed my life 37 years ago, one of the things God asked me was this. I was in India. And uh, are you willing to stand for this truth? Even if everybody, every Christian in this country that was India says you're wrong and will consider you a heretic. I said, yes. I said, Lord, I've seen it. I've studied your word carefully and you've given me revelation and it's changed my life. I will stand for it. And it came pretty much to that in the early days. Are you willing to stand? I want to ask you that direct question. Are you willing to stand for something which you have carefully studied God's word and seen to be the truth, even though most of the Christians you know don't believe it? Or do you find your comfort in saying, well, there are a number of people who believe this, so I suppose I must be right. That is a mistake the people in the wilderness made. They thought 10 out of the 12 spies must be right. And that's how they missed God's will. God was not well pleased with them. Very often God will bring you and me to the place where he sees whether we are willing to trust him and stand true to him. Even when most of our other fellow believers disagree with us because they don't love the truth like you do. May God help you to take the right decision. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, we pray that you'll help us to see what a tremendous price you paid to purchase us, to make us what you want us to be, completely conformed to the image of Christ our Lord. Please help us, Lord, let the light of God shine from heaven brightly in our midst in these days. We humbly ask in Jesus' name. Amen.